Welcome to Answers Unleashed podcast. The following video may be sensitive for some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome to Answers Unleashed, a talk show to help you reshape your brain with science and faith so you find the answers in front of you. Hi, I am your host, Olympia LaPointe. If you know anything about my Answers Unleashed talk show, you know that I have specific guests on my show. And these individuals are people that have a brilliant background and story that they share. Not only do they have a brilliant background, they have a message and a message that you can take with you on your daily journey and life. So in this particular podcast, in this video podcast that we have right now, we're going to be looking at and understanding how to stand up for your life. When we go through really tough situations in life, sometimes we have this tendency to want to just stay locked up, stay depressed, not go anywhere or do anything. And it takes a lot of courage to stand up and move forward to the future that you want. Today's guest, Tangerine is our newest Einstein. And if you know what I talk about, newest Einsteins are the individuals that bring you information that you can take with you. Tangerine is a comedian, an actress, and a producer. And she has not only been seen on Family Time for eight seasons, she was also on The Millennials for two seasons, and you've seen her on TV shows before. She is a, a fellow alumni from California State University, Northridge, in the radio TV film department, and she pledged Delta before. She is a leader and a transformational motivational speaker who has three key messages for us to share today. Welcome, Tangerine. Ooh, thank you so much for that intro, Olympia, and for calling me a, a new Einstein. I like that phrase. Thank you. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Well, first off, I want to thank you for being on Answers Unleashed. You know, I have followed you for years. You are a fellow alumni from California State University, Northridge, and I have watched you over years throughout all your TV shows, throughout your stage performances, and throughout your your personal life journeys. And I really want to take us back, take us back to the moment in time that you knew that you wanted to be an actress. And you mentioned before that you and your family used to sit at this table and watch TV shows when you were younger. Tell us about that. Oh yeah, my dad worked at night and my mom worked in the daytime, but we would gather around the TV in the kitchen, sitting down at the table, having dinner every night. So I would pick what show we watched and I felt really proud of myself to that my parents let me pick the show and that was our family bonding. And I thought all families did that because I was watching, you know, non-black shows on TV. They were sitting around black shows on TV. They were sitting around, you know, eating. So I thought everybody did that. And so that was just something that I, I really cherished. But me being on TV myself didn't um, occur to me from that. It occurred to me from doing school plays when you have to do the, the multicultural room performances in elementary school. The one I did in the first grade, that's when I, that's when the acting bug bit me. That's when I really enjoyed controlling the emotions in the room. That, that is so fascinating. So it was first grade, first grade when you knew mm -hmm. you were designed to be on stages. Yes, that's when I knew I liked this feeling. Me standing in front of this cafetorium, as they call them, multi-purpose rooms in the in the gym slash cafeteria slash you know auditorium. I was a gingerbread in Hansel and Gretel, and I just had one line. But when I said it, you know, the crowd had a reaction. They laughed a little bit, and I was just like, "Ooh, I did that! I want to do this thing for the rest of my life." And I didn't know what it was called, but I figured it out. And you have a gift, and you have a gift to transform the energy in audiences. And you not only do that now through your comedy, in which we're going to talk about a little later on, you you learn that and learn that feeling in first grade. And when you're sitting there with your family watching television, what were you thinking when you were watching those television shows? I was just thinking this is, you know, normal. This is fun. This is my mom and dad. And this is what we do every night before my dad leaves to go to work. This is, this is, this is our normal 
time together. So that that TV time was that chance for families to bond and for your family to bond specifically. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that passion was in your radar for for your youngest years. And like all of us, we go through things in life that are sometimes extremely difficult, extremely difficult. And you have this passion. You knew that you wanted to perform and you knew that you were going to be on stages, but it wasn't always easy to get to that point. And there were things that happened in your life. And I, I'm, I was so uh, amazed and impressed. Um, if you have a chance to check, check out her website, tangerine.com, she has her, uh, her biography there. And a lot of people don't know that you are a motivational speaker for women specifically. Mm-hmm. And you've gone through a lot. And I I really, truly appreciate one of the first messages that you bring to the table. And I'm going to put my glasses on here to really hone in on this message. It's to learn the lessons of your past. And you don't have to run from life when things get really tough. And yes. I, I, uh, I really, for my own personal background, I went through so much and I really truly appreciated that that comment and that statement that you share with young girls because a lot of people do not know that although being a comedian although although being a successful producer right now you had to go through your own challenges and relationships that made you a stronger person tell us more about the two that I know that there was two specific relationships that were really tough mm-hmm. and if you can share with our young women out there who may be in really tough relationships um, that they're not alone. And if if you could share your personal story of how you had to overcome your own traumatic experiences and still find a way to not run away from your life, but stand up for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I will start by saying when I was probably a preteen, I remember going down the street from my house to visit a relative and their next door neighbor was a young couple, I think like maybe juniors or seniors in high school, they were arguing, cursing each other out, being super disrespectful. And I remember the girlfriend was like, well, give me back all the stuff I bought you. And she took back the Jordan she had given them and she was just putting stuff in boxes and they were throwing things at each other. And I was like excited watching this. I was like, ooh, I can't wait to grow up and get into a relationship like this. This is so dramatic and fun and exciting. And then I realized um, that I had, gravitated towards that type of relationship when I did get older. So I was dating a guy and altogether we dated for about six years. It was a a really strong connection because I was so young and I really, really, you know, we were sleeping together and, you know, that connection when you have that puppy love and you're having sex, it's a really strong bond. The oxytocins are secreting. You don't, you can't stop thinking about this person. Um, But he wasn't the best, you know, lover for me, for my heart, you know? So obviously he wasn't faithful. He wasn't honest. And I, we break up sometimes. And one time when we were going through an issue, another guy who knew him, who was also too old to be dating me was telling me, you should get rid of this guy. You should give me a chance. And so I took his advice, gave him a chance. Cause he was like, that guy's cheating on you. And so this other guy, I dated him for a while. And one night when he thought that I was about to, I guess, betray his trust, he reached into my car window when I was parked outside outside my coworker's house because I had dropped my coworker off who lived two blocks from where I was working. He reached into my car and strangled me. And strangled uh, you. Strangled, strangled me. He choked me. He strangled me and was just yelling, you know, because he thought I was about to, I guess, cheat on him or something. And I wasn't. I was just dropping off this guy who lived right around the corner from where I worked. And then I was going to take my little narrow butt on home by myself. So he mm-hmm. choked me. Um, the whole time we were dating, he was really um abusive verbally and and really demanding in the bedroom. Like, you know, you're going to have sex with me for this long and you're going to do this sexual act to me for this long. And when I finally decided that I could do better, I broke up with him. And on the car ride, uh, the breakup car ride, he uh, raped me. And it was like, I don't know if I should tell anybody because we've had sex before. So it's really date rape, but he pulled my underwear off He threw himself on me. I had a big scratch on the side of my leg for a really long time, for like a few years. Um, I was crying during the whole act. It was a horrific experience, but he didn't see it that way. So 
I got rid of him after sh- being strangled before, and being raped. Before before you continue, I want to say that is a horrible situation. And oh. no one, no woman, no person should ever be in a situation where they are physically violated like that. And no one, uh, no one has the right to do that to another person. And it is a traumatic experience. It is a horrible experience for, for the person who is, is going through that. And even for the perpetrator, because it's, it, I, it's a just psychologically horrific thing in every direction that you look at. And there's a lot of women who may have gone through similar way, have gone through uh, something that is borderline that way. How did you know that this wasn't right? And how did you know that that type of relationship was something in which you you had to get yourself out of? Um, I mean, how many times should you be strangled before you realize this probably isn't a good relationship? It took one time for me. And then this being the same person who would, you know, demand certain sex acts and the same person who eventually, you know, ripped my underwear off and had sex with me in my car while I'm crying just didn't seem healthy to me. So I was like, you know what? I didn't really want to date this person in the first place. They kind of talked me into it. I need to get rid of him because I don't deserve this kind of treatment. Um, So I broke up with him went back to the guy that I had left him for. And that wasn't a better relationship. It was just another form of a relationship I shouldn't have been in, but I grew from. So with this person, I was constantly being uh, lied to and cheated on, but he loved me tremendously. And it was a weird love. And I think my beginning example of a story of seeing a couple arguing and wanting to be that couple when I got older, I think when you grow up seeing certain types of relationships, you think that it's okay and it's normal. So I think that this guy thought that cheating and lying, you know, because he's good looking and women are throwing themselves at him, that he could get away with stuff like this and still have a woman at home that was going to be faithful and wait for him and love him. So when I eventually broke up with him and moved uh, back into my mom's house, only because my mom had asked me to help her with the bills. So because she had a really huge house and and, uh, she was just like, you know, you're giving your money away to this this landlord that you don't know. You know, you're helping the white man, as she said it. No offense to anybody who's watching this, um, not black, but that's how my mama talks. She's old school. And she was like, come come home and, you know, help me out. So God bless my mom, because if this had happened with me living alone like I had been, because let me tell you what happened, ladies and gentlemen, I went back home to live with my mom. And within a couple of months, this boyfriend of mine that I had just broken up with broke into my mother's house while I was asleep. And beat me over the head with a blunt object. And he left a gallon of bleach and a laundry bag, an empty laundry bag. So I don't know what he planned on doing with me, but he couldn't finish his goal because I was screaming so loud that my mother eventually was like, what's wrong? What's wrong? From upstairs, she's yelling at me downstairs. You having a bad dream? Are you okay? Are you okay? And I was just like, mom, somebody's hitting me. And she just thought I was dreaming. And I kind of thought I was dreaming at first. And then when she finally said, I'm on my way and I'm bringing my gun. The hitting stopped. And mm-hmm. it was like a, like a, somebody had pushed pause on this horrific movie. The person mm-hmm. stopped hitting me. I tried to open my eyes, but there was too much blood on my eyelids to open them. I had to wipe the blood off my eyelids. I tried to see what was going on in my room. There's blood all over the walls, the headboard. My mattress and everything is soaked in blood. My mom finally comes downstairs. Still not sure if anybody was in the house. She stays in the front of the house, calls the police from the phone in the kitchen, and when the police get there, they ask me who did. I, I call 911 as well on, on, on the phone in my room. I don't tell the police who did it because I'm scared that he's still in the house hiding and he can hear me. And so it was a whole court thing of them saying, well, you told 911 you didn't know who it was and yada, yada, yada. The point is, I broke up with this man and he said, if I can't have you, no one can. And he didn't want to break up. And I always knew that that would happen because that's something he told me while we were dating. And I was like, wow, this is real love. This is amazing. He loves me so much. He doesn't ever want to lose me. He got my name tattooed on both of his arms. Every time he would get in trouble with me, he'd go get a tattoo. Look how much I love you. Your name is right here. Well, it's spelled wrong, first of all. So he's like, oh, what? It is. I'm like, yeah, that letter's not in my name. So then he goes and gets it on the other arm and then he puts oh, a design wow. under it. All of this is wow. his way of showing love. 
I thought it was cool. After being hospitalized and, and, and my mom saying, hey, you need to move to Atlanta because this person tried to kill you and they're not done. They're probably going to come back to the house and try to finish you off. And I said, I don't think God put me here to die over this man's hand. I think I'm here to be a light. I think I'm here to tell the world that they should get out of these types of relationships. I think I'm the common denominator in people who are uh, being abused in these relationships. It's like, these are two different men, but I'm the one getting abused. This is a this is a me problem. I'm, so I don't want to play victim. So you knew there was a common denominator in these type of situations and you had the ability to shift it. Tell us about that. Learning to not uh, be the victim in your experiences. When I realized that I was a common denominator in those relationships, I was like, oh, let me choose better. And you had this big decision in front of you, which mm -hmm. was, do you go the route that your mother suggested, which was to run and and leave to Atlanta to a family member in which you had not known if I remember that correctly. Right. I'd never met these these relatives in Atlanta. I'd never even been to Atlanta at this point. Yeah. It, or do you stand up for your life at that moment and continue doing what you were planning to do? And this brings us to the second point, uh, which I love is you you can't dwell on the negative. You have to focus on what you want. You can't dwell on the negative. You have to focus on what you want. And here you were during this time coming out of the hospital and you wanted to be an actress. Yes. You I six. knew since you were mm -hmm. six, you mm -hmm. wanted to be an actress and you were given the opportunity to at California State University, Northridge, what was your decision at that moment in time? My decision was to stay in town. Um, I had already been doing some acting. I had had done a lot of theater around my local area of Inglewood Playhouse. I had um, started to get a couple auditions and I just knew that I was here for a bigger reason. So my decision was no, I'm not gonna move to Atlanta to live with some relatives that I don't know. In fact, my mother had even put me at her friend's house when I got out of the hospital, she had me go stay with a woman I'd never met before and hide out there. And I was afraid there because that woman went off to work or went and did something. And I was in this empty house by myself. And I was like, I don't feel any safer here than if I was back at home with my parents. But there was a long time where I couldn't even look at the bedroom that this happened in. When I would go home, mm. I would I would ask my parents, can you go get my clothes for me to wear for this week? Or can you go in there and get my shoes? I wouldn't go in that room because it was such a traumatic memory. But I didn't let that fear of that room last that long because I was like, I got to get over this. I got to get over this. So um, How did I wanted to dwell it? on this. How, no, I, like Going into that room, what, what did you do? What did you do in your mind when you went into that room to get over it? And then I'm assuming it's the same type of process that you took when you had to go back to school. What what was going through your head in that moment where you you chose you were going to get over this? Uh, bring us into your mind so so people, especially women who are going in through a certain type of traumatic uh, event and remembering that they can learn to turn that type of thinking on. Um, good question. And also for women who are going through this, I will say that I've I've been told for so many years that if a woman is in an abusive relationship and she stays, it's because she's weak. It's because she's afraid. She should know better and know her worth. I stayed in a relationship where I knew he was crazy because every time I broke up with him, he would show up at my parents' house while I wasn't there, while I was in my apartment away at college. I'd come home to see my parents and my ex-boyfriend would be there shooting pool with my dad or helping my dad with the lawn or playing with the dogs or doing a, a, hard, a handiwork favor for my mother. Or I'd go to work and he'd be sitting there. Um, when I was waiting tables at a diner all night trying to pay for my school, he'd go to my job and my coworkers would be like, oh my God, he's so sweet. He's so cute. You should take him back, girl. He's this, he's that. And so he was a really charismatic person like the Eddie Haskell and Leave it to Beaver. So it was really hard for me to leave him because guys were like, oh, I'm not dating you. You're dating that guy. And they knew me as that guy's girlfriend. They knew he was crazy. So it was like, every time I tried to get away with him, from him, he was right there. So it was a different situation than what a lot of people go through. But sounds like a stop. It, definitely. Stalker. But there weren't stalker laws back then. So it was it wasn't anything illegal until somebody actually harmed you. It wasn't until a celebrity and, you know, uh, Princess Di and those kind of people started saying, hey, this person is dangerous that they actually made stalker laws. So for then I was just like, yeah, I couldn't get rid of him. 
So going back to school, as soon as I was in the hospital, maybe by the next day, I was like, I got to get back to school. I'm an orientation leader. I've got new freshmen coming in. I want to give tours. I want to show them about the new scholarships. I love helping people and I can't wait to get back to school, even though I have a sling on my arm and a gel cast on my ankle. And I have a bloody bandage around my head that my brother wrote a Nike sign on the side of. And they said, don't wash your hair because you've got 22 stitches across your forehead and you can't put the water in the soap. So I went to school right away, no fear. And I just wore the Nike sign and I had the crutches and I was just, you know, going to class and giving the tours. And when somebody said, Hey, what happened to your head? I'd say same thing that happened to my leg. What happened to your leg? Same thing that happened to my arm. Like I really was being very elusive. Vague, very, <laughs> very vague, vague. <laughs> because I didn't want to get into it. I wasn't ashamed of it, but it's like, hey, I'm on my way to my next class. I've got a short amount of time to get across campus in my little high heels and jeans that I like to wear. I don't have time to tell you the story of my crazy boyfriend, but going into my bedroom was much scarier, much more hard, much more difficult than me going back to school. And that process um, probably took a couple of weeks and would have taken longer had I not started hanging out with a guy friend of mine. And I told him I didn't want to go in my room. And he was like, oh, girl, you still tripping on that? And it made me feel bad. And oh, I was like, you know what? Let wow. me put on my britches and my big girl panties and go in this room. Talk to him a year later. And he said, oh, I had no idea it had happened so recently. I would have never said that. But because oh, he said that, wow. he pushed me to get over it. But he was still, like, what? I can't you're very it. strong. I'm telling you, you're very strong. I was like, you're I, right. Why I've am been I looking at this? the room for two years. <laughs> <laughs> I might have, but he was like, get over it. And then while I was in college, I was taking a speech class. I wrote a speech on, you know, being raped. And while I was in college, I took because I was majoring in radio, speech, TV, and film. Speech about that. Yeah. So I said a speech in front of the class about why people rape and how powerful it is for the person who's doing the crime and what it you know does to the woman emotionally. I, I, wow. I, gave, I researched all this information and I gave a speech on it. So it was like therapy for me. And then in my script writing class, I wrote a script about falling in love with a guy who tried to kill you when you broke up. And so that was therapeutic because at that time, you know, people weren't doing commercials and telling you to go to therapy and black people weren't like, you know, oh, I see my therapist every Tuesday and it keeps me centered. Like we weren't doing that. So I was getting my therapy from my homework assignments and just talking about it to people. And it just like helped me get over it quickly. So that's why I can just say it so like this, like, oh, da, 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 da. And, and I had done vegan eggs for breakfast because I've done the work. Psychology, it's it's doing the work. It's processing yeah. those feelings. And I completely understand. And my audience knows that, that they, they know that when I was eight, I went through a similar thing. And when you're a child like that, you don't necessarily know how to deal with those emotions, how to deal with those feelings. And, and often that you, uh, it, as when you're a child and molested or, or in a horrible situation like that, you push it to the edge of your memory. So you don't have to mm -hmm. deal with it until you're able to process it. Yeah. So you were able to process it through speech, through your, your cinema, cinematic work and through your script writing. And mm -hmm. that brings us to the, the last uh, topic which was finding something to be grateful for when things are not necessarily the way you want it yet, but yeah. finding that way to be grateful for it. So here, here I'm listening to you. And if I'm hearing you, you are finding ways to use your talent to heal yourself in to use your talent of writing, to use your talent of, of speaking. And that, talent translated itself not only to tv shows that uh, with you being an actress and and walking across the stage at california state university northridge but it also translated in you to being on family time for several seasons where people were watching you on the screen in in you mimicking that opportunity for families to watch you on the screen so their family can be bonded and you were also on millennials and it took it to a step further. You chose to transform audiences with comedy. Yeah, How yeah. I, I became, I went from TV sitcom acting to live sketch comedy, performing like a comedy troupe around different theaters in Hollywood to now being a stand-up comedian. I've been doing that since March of 2018. It's now March of 2023. So it's officially five years that I've been doing stand up, but I just love making people laugh. That's what I loved about being the, the, the cardboard cutout gingerbread man when I was six years old was that I, I could make a whole room of people laugh. And it felt good to forget your problems, forget that your rent is due and you don't have all of it to forget that you don't like the job you just left. Cause now it's like, okay, 
put your purse down, take your jacket off and let's forget about what's out there. Let's just have fun in here. And I love being able to do that for people all over the country. So it was transforming that pain, that pain that we all go through, through whether it be very traumatic situations or even very stressful situations. It was taking mm -hmm. that, the ability to, to take a very tough situation and transform it. And yeah, absolutely. when you first started, you were one of the very few women. Tell us about that. When I started, uh, when I met my husband, I was doing a round table weekly talk show called Speedy's Comedy Corner. It was hosted by Jamie Foxx's friend, Speedy. It was on Jamie Foxx's radio channel called Foxhole Radio. And that was on Sirius XM. And it was a round table of, of male stand-up comedians. So it was Rodney Perry, Corey Holcomb, uh, Zoe Williams was just there because he's an author and he's an, just an intellect. Um, Lou Dix, uh, Speedy, who am I missing? Clayton Thomas, um, a couple other guys and me. I was the only woman on that show every week. And we would sit there for two hours and talk about hot topics, make jokes about things that were going on in the news. And we would take live callers from truck drivers because that's usually who has Sirius XM because you can drive across country without truck having to change drivers. your radio station. So truck drivers <laughs> would call in ask us questions, give us advice, talk mess. And I had to be very, very defensive on that show because everybody was making fun of somebody, make fun of what you're wearing, wow. make fun of your hair. And so I had to just have my guards up. And so it just kept me quick and witty and on my toes. And all the guys would flirt with me and it was silly and, and, and innocent, fun flirting. And so when Clayton Thomas would flirt with me, it was like, boy, get out of here. You know, I'm just dodging everything. And then come to find out Clayton Thomas cut to... A year later, I was working on another radio show and they said they needed a third host. And I said, oh, you should hire my friend Clayton Thomas. Clayton Thomas came over. We worked together for a year. And now 2023, I've been married to that man um, yeah. for the last nine years. But I never thought we were going to end up being a couple because I was in there doing this the whole time as the only woman just trying to. <laughs> You're holding your own. You're, now, yeah. now, your husband is 100 percent different than all of the the. Uh, troubled men i call them troubled yes, men, uh, yes. That, that you experienced before and he had completely different qualities where he was loving caring mm -hmm. where he was a commitment minded uh good man yeah what was the what was the turning point where you saw hmm i i am looking at a really great man and this is a man that i'm going to choose tell us about that so he and I had been friends for two years because we did a year of radio with Foxhole Radio. Then we did a year of radio with dherbs.com radio. And then I was going to my church. And so I had done a Valentine's Day workshop at the church. And in the workshop, they had us writing a letter to our future lover, telling them how much we were grateful for all the things we were doing and writing exactly specifically what we were doing, you know, vacationing and, you know, if we wanted kids or housing, whatever. And so writing that out and seeing it and writing the qualities that I was thanking my lover for, I started listing things and writing things. Then we even wrote them a Valentine's day card, even though I didn't know who this card was going really? to be writing out a card. We're giving thanks to this person in advance. Do you remember what just, some of the things were? Just I still have the card somewhere, oh, but do. I just remember, you know, us vacationing. I remember us uh, laughing and doing date nights often and complimenting one another. Like I, I was very specific on what I wanted. And, and when I came home from that workshop, it was two days before actual Valentine's Day. I looked at the list and I looked at my friend Clayton Thomas and I looked at the list. And I looked at my friend Clayton Thomas and I said, he's been flirting with me for the past two years and I've been laughing him off let me give him a chance. And I was like, Hey, you, you want to hang out seriously? And so let me give him a shot. And he's been amazing. So he was there with you all along and you noticed him and I finally he had noticed been, him. Yeah. Yeah. He was giving you, uh, attention and then your eyes opened to see who he was. One thing I learned from my church back in 2006 is when I started going to it. And in November was Thanksgiving month. And the, and the uh, minister said, hey, this week, write down what you're thankful for every single day for the week and just give gratitude. Even if it hasn't happened yet, write it in the present tense as if it has. Thank you for sharing your personal story and sharing it in a way that will inspire people to know that they always have a choice in their situations. And the second thing that I wanted to share is that you to tell the listeners as well as the watchers, how can they find you? And to find me, you can find me at tangerine.com 
or on Tangerine or official Tangerine at all social media p- platforms. I'm official Tangerine on Facebook and Instagram, and I'm regular just Tangerine on YouTube, on uh, what's the other one on Twitter? It's spelled T A N J A R E E N T A N J A R E E N. You can find me all over. And if you forget, just go to tangerine.com. Tangerine, it has been a pleasure to have you here on Answers Unleashed. Thank you so much for having me, friend. It's so good to see you. So pretty. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, there you have it. You have a great guest that you have the opportunity to play this podcast back, listen to it and hear the story again and know that you can stand up for your life. I am Olympia LaPointe, host of Answers Unleashed, seen on AnswersUnleashed.com and I'll see you next week.